Rocky Mountain area of the United States. Uh, Mr. Bradley also uh, serves as chairman of the White River Hub Corporation in Colorado and has, has been involved with INGA and has served as the chairperson for INGA. Uh, Mr. Bradley has 35 years of experience in the oil and gas industry. He began his career with Exxon Mobil Corporation and later held a variety of management positions in domestic and foreign natural gas operations that Texas Eastern Corporation, Coastal Corporation, and El Paso Corporation. Uh, he joined Questar Corporation in 2005 and has guided us through quite a few significant expansion projects for pipelines and compressor stations. Uh, I jumped the gun, but Mr. Bradley is also the chairman of the INGA Board of Directors. He has served on, he's also served on the Board of Directors and Executive Committee, Executive Committee of the INGA Foundation. He is originally from Virginia and holds undergraduate degree in management science from Georgia Tech and an MBA from Tulane University. He and his wife Millie have two children and split their time between homes in Park City and Dallas, Texas. And he's also a, a pretty big sports fan, so you can chat him up. And he's, he's fluent in football, baseball, basketball, and even and even European soccer. And, I got to know that we both kind of follow the same European soccer team, which is Tottenham Hotspur, and you can equate them to being the BYU of the English Premier League. They never quite get it done, but they, they have high hopes every year. <laughs> so with that, I'll turn the time over to Alan. I'm going to slip my iPhone into his pocket, so those we're broadcasting this through a WebEx as well. Thanks, Chad. Uh, hopefully you can hear me. I'm wired three different ways, so it uh, should be interesting. Um, thanks for that introduction, and uh, also uh, want to acknowledge I do have a son who's a petroleum engineer, and uh, he's working out of Dallas, and so obviously there were several reasons why I wanted to speak today when Chad invited me a couple months back. Uh, one, uh, SPE is an incredible organization. To you know, I always want to support uh, you know, Questar's uh, participation in organizations like this. And nothing uh, strikes home better than seeing your uh, SPE values of excellence, integrity, professionalism, lifelong learning. Hopefully, we'll learn something this morning. If not, I will fail. Diversity, volunteerism, social responsibility. You know, those are important to any organization, whether you're a professional organization, or whether you're a corporation. So I want to share with you Questar Corporation's purpose and values. We have a very simple purpose. It's really to make lives better by developing and delivering essential energy. Yes, we're primarily a natural gas company, but we touch all of the basic energies, whether it's NGLs, crudes, condensate. So we're in this in a big way, focused in the Rockies, more importantly, our core beliefs and values translate very nicely to SPEs as well. However, there is one that you have that we don't, and there's one we have we're financially oriented. Uh, we really don't have a big R&D presence. So I want to focus back on innovation because the real crux of the presentation today is the really the story that's been unfolded in the industry, and that's the important innovations that have occurred over the last 10 to 15 years driven by people like yourself. When you look at simple things like 3D uh, technology, seismic, looking at uh, hydraulic fracking, looking at uh, horizontal drilling, it goes on uh, proprietary drill bed design uh, to pad drilling, top drive wells. Today, we really have taken the exploration out of this industry and we've turned it into a production process, which has been a phenomenal transformation. It's one that's very new. So when we talk about looking at the economics of oil and gas midstream investments, it really is all about supply and demand fundamentals, what's happening in the marketplace, overlaid by technology improvements and the ability for companies like Questar Pipeline to make a profit for its shareholders transporting that gas from point A to point B. A little bit about Questar 
corporation. Uh, Chad talked about that in the introduction. But basically, uh, our history goes back to the 1920s. Uh, we're a long-standing company. It's a company that has a really uh, glorious history in this industry. We have been uh, independent our entire uh, career. I've been with several companies that have been bought and sold probably three or four times. Today, that's the norm. It's very unique to find a culture like Questars that has the longevity of a company uh, in this industry that we do. So I'm, I'm very proud of it. It's a culture, quite frankly, that resonates with me. That's why uh, Questar attracted to me uh, almost, uh, nine, it's been nine years now uh, since I joined. So uh, if you think about where we were in 2010, we had a major EMP company that had taken advantage of the new technologies and had grown the EMP business within Questar dramatically. In the middle of 2010, we spun Questar's EMP business off to our shareholders. It's now its own company, QEP Resources, based in Denver. We retained Wexpro, which is a unique company that develops natural gas under a cost of service model. And these are reserves that are dedicated to our utility, Questar Gas. Questar Pipeline is in the middle of the utility, and Westboro and producers were focused in three major basins in the Rockies. Uh, we operate four interstate natural gas pipelines that are regulated by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. Uh, total miles of pipe, a little over 2,600 miles. So we're small as interstate pipelines go. We're regionally oriented. Our most strategic asset is a storage basin in, in Utah called Clay Basin with 54 uh, BTF of working capacity. It's the largest storage facility in the Rockies, and it's integral to meeting the winter heating requirements of uh, Utah and Wyoming uh, through Questar Gas. It's one of the largest Clay Basin customers, so we're integrated in that respect. Uh, Questar Gas delivers uh, to over uh, 930,000 customers, uh, primarily in Utah, southwestern Wyoming, a little bit of Idaho, but clearly uh, Utah is the biggest market. So we have a nice integrated model. We've retained this integrated strategy and surfaced well for over 75 years. Obviously, you know, we like our position uh, in the Rockies. And uh, a lot of exciting things happening in each one of these business units, but I'm going to focus specifically on the midstream, the pipeline business. I'm going to look at some of the lessons we learned during the build-out of the Rockies pipeline network uh, on the back end of the tremendous production growth we saw in the Rockies in the early part of the uh, uh, 2000 to 2008 time frame. So uh, I'm going to talk about Rockies markets, past and present. I'm going to give you a, a little more overview of how our system, how strategically we redesigned our system to take advantage of natural gas production growth in the Rockies. I'm then going to look at what's happening in oil markets, because as we all know, that's where the action is today, oil and liquid rich plays. And then we're going to look at this phenomenon that's been occurring where traditional oil pipeline expansions are starting to see more and more competition by the railroads, which is a relatively new phenomenon. And we're going to talk about how a natural gas pipeline company like Questar has now gotten involved in a crude by rail project utilizing a pipeline that we own in California. We'll give you a little uh, sort of practical update on a uh, potential project that's being driven by basis differentials in, uh, in crude oil space. And, and I know I say Q and A's at the end. This is an informal presentation, so if you have any questions, just raise your hand or shout it out. We'll make it conversational. But uh, sometimes it's instructive to look at the past, and I pull this chart out because it was a chart that we had a lot of debate over back in 2007. Gas prices were uh, seven or eight dollars a decatherm. Uh, everybody saw it rising. We couldn't build enough capacity out of the Rockies at this period of time. So what we were trying to do is measure pipeline capacity in the Rockies with production forecasts so we could stay ahead of the production growth with the infrastructure to move it. So 
so that we didn't experience what was referred to at the time as these basic blowouts that the Rockies were plagued with. And a blowout is simply having the price for natural gas in the Rockies disconnect from national gas prices, which was set by Henry Hub uh, basis. So there were times when Henry Hub was three, four dollars, Rockies gas was under a dollar because there was so much production facing capacity, you couldn't build it quick enough. So when you get in that kind of environment, there's a tremendous incentive on the part of the visitors to support new pipeline expansions. And in this period of time, we had Rockies production probably 2015, 2016, growing to 15 BCF a day with an existing export capacity, including local Rockies demand of about a BCF, a little over BCF a day, at roughly 9.4. And we just come off some major expansions. Kern River had looped its system. We had uh, Rockies Express come into play, and we're still not able to keep up. So it was in this environment the Ruby Pipeline got contracted, and we were still looking at on the order of two BCF a day of additional new pipelines yet to be built, and we still had a shortfall relative to this production forecast. And I must admit, our team was down along the purple line trying to be conservative. QEP, our producer, was trying to incentivize new production and had this higher forecast. I've often wondered you know, what QEP would say today if I showed them the slide, because we're all vastly wrong in our uh, thinking. But nevertheless, if, if you look at the national grid in 2007, 2008, the Rockies was the epicenter of new pipeline capacity expansions. Every major interstate pipeline in North America was in the Rockies trying to promote an expansion project. And this was after Rockies Express had already been built to Clarence in Ohio. We had uh, a Kinder Morgan expansion in Chicago. We had TransCanada and Alliance Pipeline, two Canadian-based interstate pipelines, looking to move gas to their import lines uh, from Canada. We had at least four different projects competing for west flows in the California and the Northwest. Uh, just a phenomenal time. At the end of the day, the only one that got built was Ruby Pipeline, uh, all the others, uh, we're not able to generate sufficient capacity. And it's probably a good thing that we stopped at Ruby. If you look at where we are today, what we take when you look at the economics of a pipeline, you really have to come up with a value at a specific point. So if you look at this particular slide, we've taken a two year average of forward natural gas prices from twenty ten to twenty twelve. And we've we've basically said, okay, whatever we guess will be wrong. But let's look at what people will transact a, a gas a contract for at Powder River versus Chicago, let's say. So Chicago gas prices were 539, Powder River, you know, you could buy gas at 495. So you basically had a basis differential of 44 cents. So you start looking at what firm transportation on projects to move gas out of Powder River would cost. Well, you had to go on a bison expansion. You had to pay Northern Border to get it to Chicago. You add those two tariffs up, and you're 73 cents out of the money. So you quickly say, okay, from an economic perspective, no one can make money on that transaction. You look at Opal to Appalachia, and this is 2010. This is not post Marcellus. Marcellus was still a science project. People did not know at the time what they were dealing with. A year after Rockies Express got built, the basis differential was 47 cents. It was a dollar 20 out of the money, recognizing that to move gas on Rockies Express was a buck 67. And this story continued virtually throughout all the major export markets in 2010. In a sense, what the market was telling us is that we had sufficient export capacity out of the Rockies. Rockies Pricing was now tracking Henry Hub, uh, the, the national markets, and we didn't need more capacity, which dramatically changed the markets. So another way to look at it, if you were looking at our internal slides, a lot of the industry consultants started to adopt this methodology, and they did something else. They also tracked prices on the same chart. 
So it's a little busy, but let me let me take this through to give you a sense for what's happening in the Rockies today when you look at production. So production is green, and this is just exports, so it excludes that BCF a day of local Rockies demand. But as you see, uh, Rockies production kind of peaked uh, export uh, about 8.2. You add that BCF plus, we probably peaked at 9.5 on our old chart. But uh, production kind of stayed flat between 6 and 8 BCF a day on the export market, yet we continue to build Ruby and Bison. Remember those projects I showed you? We built them because we had to have those commitments in 07 and 08 to have a line in by 2011. It takes three, four, sometimes five years to go through a permitting and regulatory process to even turn earth, and then it probably takes another uh, 12 months to get a pipeline of any magnitude in the ground. So commitments that were made for Ruby ultimately anchored additional capacity at a time where, well, the market really didn't need it. Uh, this pipeline got built uh, in any way, and it, as it turned out, and I'll talk in a minute, the California markets turned out to be the stronger markets of the export direction. They're stronger than the east, they're stronger than the south, uh, taking it down through Trans Colorado and some of the other uh, quarters. So what happened when we finally reached this point of surplus capacity is that prices between Opal and Henry Hub basically flatlined. You know, they tracked perfectly, just like you would expect in, a, in, a, in an economic model like this. The differential is just the fuel. That's the variable cost to move gas from the Rockies uh, to Henry Hub. And uh, you kind of expect that. So today, when you look at our production forecast, which will be wrong, we're saying it's going to re remain relatively flat, which is a major accomplishment when you look at the number of rigs that we've got at Rockies in pursuit of uh, value plays elsewhere. But we can still have flat production. That's attributed to the production efficiencies that producers are getting fewer wells, but they're also drilling more. They're getting higher production rates. That technology is a wonderful thing in our industry. But what it says is that we have somewhere between, you know, 7 and, and 11, about 4 BCF of, of open Rockies export capacity. And that's not a great market to be in because we're competing on a variable cost basis. Our fuel has to be lower than our competitor. Uh, recontracting becomes an issue because producers who have anchored these pipelines with long-term contracts, when those contracts expire, they're going to say, I've done the heavy lifting. I don't need a reserve capacity in this market anymore because there's four PCF of capacity available. I'll use it on an interruptible basis, and it will be equivalent to firms. So there's a very interesting dynamics that occurred once the build-out of midstream pipeline capacity exceeded the production forecast. I think most producers would kind of agree with this scenario going forward. The question is, when will those rigs return to the Rockies when prices strengthen to start production on a growth trend again? Because we all know there's hydrocarbon there. It's just a question on the economics and the pricing signals to get those rigs back. So uh, as you think about the higher value basins, they say, well, where, where do these rigs go? Well, the green are the liquid-rich oil plays. We're all familiar with them. The black show rig declines. The red increases, and we don't have any, you know, would be increases in black gas folks in the folks area. So in 2010, there were no increased rigs moving into dry gas plays of greater green, peons. Uh, all the play, uh, this was uh, Barnett, Haynesville, I mean, you know these plays. Even Marcellus in 2010 uh, lost 23 rigs. Uh, on the dry gas side of the Marcellus, on the wet side, where everybody was looking at the NGLs, so they continue to grow. So the big basins, obviously, uh, Bakken Shale, Williston, Permian, no surprise there, Eagleford, South Texas. Uh, seeing a lot in the mid-continent, Anadarko, you're seeing Niobrara start to develop. And of course, the Uinta Basin has a liquid-rich uh, play to it, uh, which uh, has been a benefit to uh, our state as well in that waxy crude. 
So uh, oh, on balance, there was a tremendous shift away from gas, where gas prices were about $3, $3.50, to crude. Crude was up over $100 a barrel. So gas had really decoupled from crude. If you, you, know, if you go back 20 or 30 years, you knew there was a long-standing historical relationship between gas and crude, and gas was competing with fuel oil in the Northeast, for backing fuel out of residential, commercial uh, customers, and bringing in natural gas. That build out occurred. Today, what are we competing with? Coal. We've got so much gas production. The marginal market today is coal. And to compete with coal, you've got to be in the market at three, three dollars and fifty cents. That's why it's so important to high grade the value of natural gas in the marketplace. And one way to do that is through transportation fuels, CNG, LNG, and you're seeing a lot of that today, stuff in the trade press. But we're just barely starting, so it's not a big increase in market. Longer term, it, it obviously will be. And it has the potential to raise prices for natural gas, which is good for producers. So a lot going on. And, and you would expect this economic behavior to occur. I mean, producers are economic players, and I think uh, it made a lot of sense. It's just unfortunate for gas pipelines like ourselves that we kind of lost that construction boom, that growth era the end of after the completion of the really pipeline in 2011. So this phenomenon really started about 2010. Producers started moving out of the Rockies from away from these dry gas plays. So, uh, so today, 2013, there have been a couple of, a couple of interesting changes or bright spots on the gas side. For the first time, we're starting to see a couple of areas where rigs are actually increasing. And if you look at you know, where they're increasing, they're increasing the shale plates next to high value markets, markets that are underserved today that value natural gas. If you look at the deep New England, they're short of gas. They've always been short of gas because it's very difficult to build infrastructure in that part of the world. So anybody see the paper today? Gas prices in Boston you know, peaked at $100 a decathlon. Maybe seventy dollars today. Shelly, I mean, is it, uh, well, I can't remember ever seeing that. Well, that's a function of a lot of demand, not a lot of pipeline capacity, because you can't get it built in that part of the world. But producers are starting to see some improvement, seeing some projects move, and they're starting to drill ahead of that. So what you see are producers in the Marcellus increasing dry gas production, bringing rigs in to take advantage of higher value. Uh, uh, markets and new capacities being put in there. And, and one of the projects that comes to mind is Spectra. Spectra just recently built a pipeline under the uh, Hudson River into the heart of Manhattan. It took them over 10 years. And I've got to admit, 30 years ago, I worked on that same project to try to do it. And we couldn't figure out the code to get it permitted and built. But they were able to do it in this environment with low gas prices. The other big play is, is really occurring in Louisiana. You know, it's a Haynesville shale. The other market that's a prize market is Florida. And there are two big pipeline expansions are being touted in Florida. You need gas for that. It's primarily around power generation in the summer. I mean, there are peak summer loads. Uh, natural gas is, is, is really replacing coal in that market. And there are pipeline expansions underway. And, and the value uh, this market is very attractive because producers and basins are very close to the economics work. So hopefully we'll see a lot more red bubbles, if you will, going forward, and some of them will return to the Rockies. But uh, don't really know when. On a national basis, what we'll say is that blue is dry gas production. Despite the rig movements between 05 and 013, uh, we grew uh, production 15.7 BCF a day. Uh, we're expecting that production between now and 2018 to grow by another cumulative 16.2 BCF. This is our market or our demand. And what we've been doing is we've been squeezing out imports of natural gas from Canada. And we'll continue to do that. Uh, so as our markets grow at 9 BCF, we're oversupplied and we're backing out Canadian imports putting a lot of pressure on Canadian uh, natural gas pipelines, a lot of reinventing flows on their system. At the same time, by 20, it's about 2017, 2016 timeframe, guess what? 
production will exceed our total needs. We'll back out all the imported uh, gas. And, and you're hearing now we need export, whether it's LNG to Europe or Asia, or maybe more importantly, it's just natural gas across the border to Mexico. They're short gas. They need natural gas. There are at least 17 cross-border pipeline projects to move growing southwestern production. It's incredible. If you saw the press release last quarter, the Mexican government for the first time opened up foreign investment into their EMP sector, uh, which has been a, a legislative mandate that would be reserved for the state. That's a big change in recognition that they can't keep up with energy demand in Mexico with the same regulatory structure they've had for 60 years. I mean, it's just amazing the change that's occurring. So uh, obviously, as an industry, we have hopes that you're going to start to see some LNG export terminals permitted and built on the West Coast. Now, why is that important? There are five West Coast LNG terminals, all with capacities of 1 to 2 BCF a day. If one goes, that's going to have a price response in the Rockies. It's going to raise gas prices. And if that happens, you'll see producers start to bring those rigs in. That can start to grow again. So uh, if you're in this industry, you're kind of rooting for a project to occur, whether it's uh, in Oregon, Washington, probably unlikely given environmental opposition. If it's in British Columbia, there are three there. There's a lot of shale production coming out of Canada. Uh, that gas today goes into the Northwest. Uh, it would be nice to see that backed out with Rockies production and have that extra out of Canada. So, uh, yes? These are world-scale LNG export facilities. When you talk vehicle fuels, you're talking small uh, LNG installations, 100,000 gallons a day. In fact, we're looking at one right here in Utah, very small, a lot like a pink shaving operation would be. These are much, much larger. We're talking uh, LNG vessels that can you know, really move huge quantities. So, very different game changer. It's going to take years before LNG as a transportation fuel makes a meaningful gain in that market line. Although it, it's, it's happening, it's happening just as uh, strong on the compressed natural gas side as well. And uh, we're seeing inroads there as new truck manufacturers bring in new engines. Yes, sir. What about the Maryland uh, Cargetti plant? Is that 60 Yes, it is. And that's the uh, co point. Co -point. Well, those are those are interesting because those were originally import facilities that are now turned around and made export facilities that have a harbor infrastructure with pipes. So the active terminals today are Cove Point, Maryland, Vistra Gas in Boston, Boston Harbor, if you fly into Logan, you go right over it. There's one in Savannah, Georgia. Where's my Georgia buddies, right? Every tour of that facility is like a walk in time when you go in the facility built in the nineteen sixties. That's a huge uh, facility that's being uh, reversed. And of course, in the Gulf Coast, you have, I think, two that have been permitted Chenier, ExxonMobil. You've got uh, the one in uh, Lake Charles, uh, the old trunk line facility. Most of the action has been focused on the Atlantic side because the natural gas markets internationally are more liquid. The prices are more transparent. There's a hub in Europe, there's a hub in Spain, the Mediterranean. You can get good price quotes. You can see the value of an LNG shipment from uh, Lake Charles versus Boston versus Trinidad, which is a big competitor for our domestic production. And people are willing to trade around those markets. And we'll talk about that in a minute in terms of Grant versus WTI on the crude side. They've always traded. They're huge liquid markets. We're just starting to develop that kind of infrastructure internationally in the natural gas industry. Historically, what happens in Europe doesn't affect North American gas prices at all. But that's changing as a result of these import-export trades that could be a couple of three years. And it'll be interesting to watch because it takes so long to get them permanent and built. Usually the markets change by the time you get those large, long, Expensive facilities still. We have a history of missing the window. We just can't get any sort of that. I mean, it was only about six years ago that uh, we were being incentivized to uh, import natural gas because we were short in natural production. Who was that? Was that Bolton? No, it was, uh, who was the head of the 
Treasury at the time who, who testified in Congress and got that started. Uh, so that, I don't know. It was a, you know, the one before Paul Volcker. Anyway, it was an interesting, and also the whole industry turned on a dime. We built uh, import facilities all over the Gulf Coast and in the Northeast. And we, most of the only one that was running at the time was District Gas. Code Point was shut down. Uh, the one in Savannah, Elba, was shut down as well. And you know, all just on a dime got themselves up and running for about a year and a half before the shield boom hit. So uh, interesting. So where did Quest start playing all this? We were not investing in any of these export pipelines. But what we wanted to do is, is we understood the Rockies. We understood our pipeline system. And we knew how to build and construct. So we went around about a strategy of creating export hubs that really protected the value of our base pipeline system. So if you look on the north, our strategy was to expand our overthrust system between the old PAL hub, which was the largest traded market uh, in the Rockies. And in 2005, we weren't connected to it. Isn't that amazing? We were like our own little island. We'd take gas from this space and bring it into the Uinta Basin. Life was good. If you're building a multi-billion dollar pipeline, what's another couple hundred miles to get to the heart of these production basins? And we didn't want to be bypassed, so we made a conscious decision that we were going to support export developers by bringing gas to these major hubs. So if you look at Wamsutter, where we delivered a Rex and WIC, you look at Opal, where we delivered a Northwest, Ruby, Kern. We added two new hubs. We added another one off our southern system called our Goshen Hub. And the most recent one we put together was White, White River Hub over in uh, Colorado. It's a joint venture with Enterprise Products, who owns and operates the Meeker plant. It was a natural extension of their uh, need to bring supplies into the Rex pipeline, the Trans-Colorado pipeline, Southern Star, CIG, that uh, using our system, bringing the gas to the kind of like a minor league, uh, cost, we, we bring the supply with the uh, major players. They didn't have to go out and connect all the wellheads. They didn't have to connect all the gas plants. We made a nice business over this time expanding our system you know, until the music stopped in, in 010. 11 when we got to uh, hit the lifting had been finished. So uh, again, a little bit of the same repeat, but I won't go through it, but we have doubled the capacity of Questar Pipeline in the last eight, nine years. We have tripled uh, the net income of Questar Pipeline over that period of time, been a major contributor to value for Rockies producers of being able to support these expansions. Uh, another thing we look at when you look at gas markets is, is storage inventory, which really affects the value of natural gas at Opal. It affects the basis differential between markets and other markets that we serve. And I just want to point out an interesting phenomenon. What most storage companies do is they look at a 10-year average, which is in this gray area right here. Those are our max and mins over a, over a 10-year period. As long as you're sort of tracking in that max and min band, you know, things look pretty good. But an interesting thing happened this year. One, producers decided and customers decided who are clay basin customers, well, yeah, and I'm not going to inject as much gas, you know, this year. I'm going to buy it on the open market. By the time I pay for gas in the summer and the fall and pay for the storage, yeah, I think I can buy it. <laughs> was that December the cold front that hit hard. And it hit hard across the country. We had record withdrawals out of storage nationwide in December. So here we are at the end of December, 56% full. We had 54, roughly 54 BCF or million decatherms. Uh, that's not a good place to be with two and a half months of winter left. And we're already you know, barely into January. And you look at the coal fronts that are hitting. This week, I expect we're going to see another record withdrawal from storage. Uh, I would argue we're probably going to be below 50%, and this line is going to continue to trend down. So what that tells you is if you come out of a winter like this, people are going to be a lot more conservative buying gas to inject next year. They don't want to be tough short. We're actually seeing some forecasts that suggest gas prices are going to rise in the spring and the summer not declines that might traditionally do as markets decide they want to 
rebuild storage nationwide. And that will have a market impact on prices, which will be good. Certainly good for uh, Westbro and, and other producers in the Rockies. So that bears watching. I talked earlier about the importance of an overthrust. Overthrust had no volume flowing through it in 04 or 05. Uh, it was a line that simply anchored the original overthrust production and moved it over to uh, uh, WIC and uh, uh, natural NGPL. What was it? Uh, Trailblazer. Trailblazer. You don't even hear people talk about Trailblazer anymore. But after uh, that was done in 79, 80, that was just when Rockies production started to come uh, on. That was the first export pipeline. And uh, by then, those fields have been depleted. The pipeline was empty. We bought our partners out uh, over the intervening period of time. Al, you were there at Columbia. Gulf was a partner. Uh, we had NGPL. We had El Paso as a partner. I bet, bet they wish they kept their interest because not only did we fill the existing pipeline up, we were able to build a high-pressure 30-inch loop line all the way across. So we have increased the capacity of over for us to where we have more firm contracts on over for us as we do plus our pipeline. Uh, it's been hugely successful. It's a core asset of Questar Pipeline. And what makes it so unique is it's bi-directional. So if you're a shipper on overthrust and Chicago markets are strong because there's a front money running through there, you can move your gas from west to east and you can load it on the Midwest pipelines. If you think California is a strong market, this year it has been a strong market in Northern California. Most of the gas now that would have flown east on, on Rex is now moving to Ruby and Northwest at Opal. So this system has a lot of flexibility and uh, obviously that's a, a marketing attribute for us and a value for producers uh, where they uh, get that flexibility. And if Southern California ever gets back on fossil fuel, you'll start to see, uh, I think, a lot more flows on Kern River. And uh, that's, that'll be a matter of time as well. So very dynamic system, one that's very attractively priced, West flows, seven cents, because uh, very economic, large volumes moving that direction. East flows, about 11 cents, and uh, very economic uh, on that system for the kind of uh, value. Uh, again, you don't just stop and leave a midsection open. We wanted to loop the entire system, so we really like the way it's positioned today. We have an available capacity, 50,000 decatherms. We have about 200,000 decatherms west, so when those rigs move back in, we won't have to add new capacity. We'll have it available. They can just sign up for it, so uh, very attractive position. Same thing on our southern system. We have a lot of flexibility with additional gas in the Lake River Hub and to Goshen uh, as uh, demand increases. So, uh, we think, you know, well, we, we want investing in huge export pipelines. We've made a great business taking advantage of what we knew on the in the Rockies and expanding our system and managing major sea points that we've developed over 75 years. So uh, that's kind of our story over the last 10 years, the, the, the tremendous growth we've seen in Rockies production. But let's move to the oil markets a second because uh, – those rigs didn't leave and do nothing. They left and basically created the same results on the oil side as they did on the gas a decade earlier. So if you look at our North American oil production since 2010, you know, as the rigs moved out, we're up 2.7 million barrels a day. This is North America. Blue is the uh, U.S. production. Yellow is Canada. It's important to look at both markets because we are interconnected. Oil moves very fungibly. It moves quickly uh, as those basis differentials. So it's always good to kind of look at Canada and U.S. as a whole. And you can see by 2018, we're going to be over 14 million barrels a day. Uh, that's, that's pretty incredible. Uh, we're growing a million barrels a day incremental every year. That's what we did 2012 over 2013. I'm seeing EIA data that suggests we're going to be another million. 2013 over 2012, and I would venture to guess 14 will be no different. And uh, when you start adding a million barrels a day to incremental production, there's a lot of infrastructure that needs to be built. Where is the growth coming from? Well, it's really coming from about four main basins. 
the rest of the U.S., the offshore Gulf, onshore Gulf, and red, relatively flat. The big players, Permian, Eagleford, Bakken, and Niobrara starting coming soon over in the eastern Rockies. That's where the action has been. That's where those rigs have moved. If you look at just the unconventional, and then you look at uh, these various plays, whether it's Monterey, uh, California, Eagleford, Texas, Permian, West Texas, San Adardo, Niobrara, we've increased production more than 80% in these unconventional oil plays just in the last two years. And, and we're approaching uh, 850,000 barrels a day in Wilson Basin, and that continues to grow. And just an incredible story there. Uh, um, and, and I think it will be continue to be told. I mean, oil is one of these commodities that uh, uh, once we uh, satisfy our own domestic demand, who thought we'd ever be uh, sort of energy secure where we didn't have to bring in in our lifetime? I think it's going to happen here uh, sometime toward the end of this uh a decade, which is a remarkable accomplishment. People remember curtailment days and gas lines. Uh, a, a really untold story, one that uh, everyone benefits from the economy today. And hopefully, you know, we'll be even starting to see people talk about lifting the ban on exporting U.S. crude oil. It's being talked about in Washington, and maybe rightly so, with this kind of result. In Canada, the same thing is happening. Uh, a little different phenomenon rather than unconventional. I guess you can call tar sands, but they don't call it tar sands anymore. That was environmentally incorrect. It's oil sands production. It is growing dramatically. It's growing 5.2 million barrels per day uh, by 2030. Uh, vast potential to continue to supply heavy crude oil uh, to U.S. and Asian markets. And uh, that's something to, to really follow and take into account when you look at crude pricing differentials. Uh, so, so where is all this uh, crude going? And, and much like you saw in natural gas, again, it follows the pattern. If you look at domestic production in red, waterborne imports, this is, this is our international crude we're bringing in, what we're doing is we're squeezing out our imports, our waterborne imports. They're projecting by 2018 only 13% of our crude demand will be supplied by waterborne imports. So we don't have far to go to get to zero. And I think uh, this forecast, while it's a Bentec forecast, is pretty representative of what everyone's looking at today. And people that are looking ahead are thinking, well, what do we do when supply exceeds demand? We want to continue to monetize our resources like we export uh, crude. So getting back to the charts we looked at, this is a, a busy chart. But it kind of shows basis differentials on the oil side. Instead of talking about Opal versus Henry Hub, we're going to switch gears a little bit because oil is an international commodity. We're really going to talk about Brent, which is a proxy for international crude, and West Texas Intermediate, which is a U.S.-based proxy for crude values in the U.S. So these prices in absolute terms are shown in red and blue. Blue is Brent. Red is WTI. The differential, you know, we talk about basic differential, is shown in this sort of light green, and it shows you how volatile over one year oil prices can be. They're impacted by a lot of events. So what you were seeing back in 2013, which a lot of midstream companies, including Questar Pipeline, recognized, you saw a huge differential between WTI and Brent. In fact, that uh, was roughly $22 a barrel. And said, my gosh, where can I back out an imported barrel of crude? And so at the time, when we we're going to talk about our project, uh, we looked at converting a line that we had in actual gas in the southwest, basically San Juan crude into California. Natural gas demand was falling off a cliff in California, just like in the Rockies, it was surplus capacity. The value of that transportation is declining. So we went about a project to convert our Southern Trails pipeline into oil service in the environment of a $22 a barrel differential. But we learned something pretty quick. And like natural gas, which takes years to get capacity in place, the Brent WTI differential changes quickly. In a matter of six months, it went from 22, it went from a high of 24 maybe 
to zero. I mean, it literally collapsed. And you say, well, you know, what happened here? Well, a lot of things were happening. One is that people weren't standing still in 2013 with all that production in the Permian, the Eagleford. They were building pipelines to get back to Gulf Coast refiners. Traditionally, crude was really supply for the local refiner. The market was kind of balanced. But with this big production growth, all of a sudden you needed long haul pipelines to move to the major uh, refining centers. So what you were seeing is you were seeing a lot of pipelines get put in place. When you put pipelines in place, the basis collapses because the commitments have been uh, put in place. You don't have the supply now competing for limited capacity. There's pipelines are moving a lot of crude in the, in the ship channel. The other thing that happened is this is the start of a new phenomenon, which was crude by rail. That started to take off 2012 and 2013. So all of a sudden, crude was getting to market. In the third quarter, things started to get a little interesting. It, when it gets hot in the Middle East, people tell no problem savers are going to have out of the anybody. Uh, there's a lot of Middle East tension, turmoil going on. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, rent started to increase again. Uh, WTI was still connected to it. Uh, what we saw is uh, also some production declines in the third quarter due to uh, uh, maintenance, uh, primarily in the Middle East. Uh, so uh, both of these markets started to increase a little bit, but then they disconnected again uh, in uh, the fourth quarter. 2013, and, and that was kind of interesting for a bunch of gas guys. What happened? Well, an interesting phenomenon was occurring. We were bringing in a new crew, uh, uh, what's called Light Louisiana Sweet, LLS. And LLS was taking over WTI. It was flooding into Cushing. It was flooding into that Gulf Coast refining corridor where there's Baton Rouge or Houston. And it was kind of taking over, if you will, the WTI. Uh, Pricing and, and there's just a limit of how much LOS crude you can use, and we've reached it. So no one wanted LOS. We drove the prices down. We disconnected again, and we're continuing to uh, disconnect. And that basis differential today is blown out somewhere around you know twelve, thirteen dollars a barrel. But I don't see uh, production Eagleford or Permian slowing down. Uh, where is it going to go? What are we going to do with it? Uh, so that's going to be interesting to follow. And uh, that's why, again, people are, are pushing uh, additional uh, export market opportunities. They're also pushing expanding crude by rail to uh, refineries on the East Coast, Philadelphia, and New York markets. Also seeing a lot of activity on the West Coast, primarily in San Francisco, LA, which uh, sort of brings us to uh, what we've been following. So if you think about infrastructure and how quickly crude production grew, you immediately think, well, where have the pipelines been? Well, the pipelines have been trying to permit new pipelines and expansions of existing systems for years now. Whether you're Keystone XL, TransCanada, almost eight years, it takes four, five, six years even to get a shovel in the ground. You're fighting regulatory delay, environmental opposition, it just didn't get into the system fast enough. And what happened is, as an interim solution, producers said, well, maybe we should look at rail. So 2012, 2011, 2012, people started experimenting with rail. By 2013, there was a huge business with two main railroads, Burlington Northern and uh, Union Pacific. Just incredible. So if you think about capacities, just kind of put a metric around it, each tank car is about 680, 720 barrels of crude. A unit train is a dedicated train, crude only. Usually can pull or handle 100 to 120 cars. It depends on the weight of the crude. Uh, for, for a train to hold up to 68 to 80,000 barrels of crude. Uh, we didn't have a clue that producers today are leasing or buying their own rail cars. So there are 10,000 rail cars already out there in, in the ground. That doesn't count the cars that the refiners have. So if you've got that sunk investment in rail cars, you're going to use them. 
And if you've made the investment, what do you like about it? Well, it gives you destination flexibility. It allows you to take it to those refiners and those markets to give you the, the higher value. And you can take multiple products. You can take them to refineries. You can take them to pipelines where they get unloaded into a pipeline. You can take them to port facilities and bars in the different locations. So a lot of flexibility. But the beauty of the whole deal was from the time you made a decision you wanted to uh, contract on one of these rail lines, 12 to 18 months later, you're in operation. It does not take long to get a rail loading or unloading facility in place. The tracks are there. So there's less initial capital requirement. There's less environmental opposition. And it's sort of a win-win as an interim solution. So the question today, is this really an interim solution? Is it going to be here for the long term? And more and more people are saying this may be a long-term solution. Well, if it is a long-term solution, my comment to both railroads is you need to step up your game because there are entirely too many incidents happening. And by that I mean whether you're in Quebec, whether you're in Alabama, or most recently whether you're in North Dakota. No one wants to see the kind of explosions and destruction that occur on one of these train sea rails. If you talk to railroads, they talk safety, but man, it's been sort of tough two or three years, and if that continues, you're going to start to see that momentum switch, I think, away from rail back to pipelines because of the safety implications. You're going to see a lot more environmental opposition. So having these loading and unloading facilities in the heart of high, heavily populated areas. So that's something to watch. They're also seeing design changes being talked about on the tank cars, the tank cars that tend to be exploding on older tank cars, they don't have the same containment systems as the newer ones. So if you own the tank cars, you're going to use them. So it's going to be hard over time to sweep those out of the system without regulation. Uh, and that's going to have a cost impact. But right now, uh, most of the incremental crude out of Bakken, uh, incremental crudes to both coasts, all uh, moving out by rail. It's just sometimes interesting. You know, they call Warren Buffett the Oracle. Well, maybe he was. He bought this railroad back in 06, 07, or right when the recession was right? thinking that, uh, oh, great time to buy coal shipments were down. And all of a sudden, he replaced the lost coal business with crude. And geographically, his pipeline system overlaid all the major oil producing basins in the country. So if you look at where the supply was in the center of our country, and where his railroads were, just a perfect match. So flexibility, growing crew destinations. This is the BNS slide. They say you know, by the end of 2014, they'll have more than 50 destination uh, markets that they can serve, which is incredible when they didn't even have a business uh, three, four years ago. Just to give you an idea, today uh, their customers have invested over $3 billion in oil facilities and associated tank cars. I haven't seen that. That's an incredible statistic for uh, the rail industry. This is an example of a, a loop track uh, in the Bakken, similar to uh, what we're looking at in California. We didn't know anything about railroads. I don't know if any of you guys have tried to go out and move a tank car from point A to point B, but it's not too different than a pipeline. They basically have a two-part rate. They have a base rate per tank car. It's based on you know, where you load it and where you take it. And they also have a monthly fuel surcharge, much like a fuel tracker that a pipeline would have. It's based on the diesel prices change dramatically. Uh, they don't want to be left with an imbalance. So you pay a monthly fuel charge per tank car per mile, which is kind of interesting, pretty straightforward. So you kind of plot out from our location in California. Everybody wants to know where it is. Well. We haven't really honed in on the site we want to disclose yet, but uh, we think we've got a great location out in the desert away from the uh, uh, population and off the uh, congested part of the rail system, which we'll talk about in a moment. So we were looking at load, unloading or destination facilities, is a better way to say it, uh, in Southern California. And we were looking at West Texas, Niobrara, and two Canadian export uh, uh, points, uh, one through uh, uh, Kansas City and another uh, through Edmonton. And as you look at the rates, I mean, what was stunning to me is just how expensive the rates were by rail, yet there's, there's still a tractor, there's still a margin for producers to make money on. 
transit times, as you'd expect, further away you are in Alberta, obviously almost two weeks, Niobrara, West Texas, about a car. Uh, cost per barrel a low, West Texas to California of about uh, $5.24, as high as eleven fifty to move it out of uh, Edmonton. Uh, so to give you kind of range for what we're talking about, to load and unload, it's probably a dollar fifty to two dollars a barrel. So you have to add probably three, four dollars on top of that. So probably maybe eleven dollars all in to move uh, from West Texas to California. You're probably talking plus to get fifteen sixteen dollars all in to move from uh, uh, the oil sands down to California. Uh, very interesting metric, something that uh, we've learned and had to learn. Uh, to look at BNS uh, historical chart, as I said, 2010, uh, they were just starting, just starting out. The gray is what they call a manifest train. That's where you tap a three or four cars onto an existing intermodal train, and uh, a unit train, as I said earlier, is a dedicated 100, 120 car train. Uh, you can see what is happening. The uh, Unit train growth has been phenomenal. 2013 averaged 616,000 barrels a day growing. And so it's been a, a tremendous market opportunity for uh, uh, Berkshire Hathaway shareholders. Uh, great timing in my mind. I guess Wes always thought about it. Uh, looking at uh, kind of what we're doing. Huh? We didn't get a uh, Union Pacific train when they were a kid. I mean, I had this very train. I had to put this, this slide up because our pipeline virtually runs along the side of the tracks here. But uh, getting back into rail is uh, interesting. As I said, we learn something new every day. So what we had is we had purchased from ARCO back in 1998 an oil pipeline, which is called uh, Line uh, 98. 90, yeah, nine, line nine. Okay. Line nine. So our thought was to take the crude line and convert it to natural gas. So we were successful taking the line from the Four Corners area to the Cal border, converting that to natural gas. But the westernmost section we never converted. It really stayed in a, a sort of an inactive state uh, since '98. We've been looking for alternatives, and one of the alternatives that came about in our strategic review of this asset uh, last spring was converting it, or recommissioning, it's a better term, recommissioning back to crude service. It's a 16-inch line which sets the capacity of, in crude service of about 120,000 barrels a day. And we thought, well, let's take advantage of the rail phenomenon by looking at building a rail tunnel out in the desert, basically between uh, Riverside and uh, Palm Springs. Uh, we have some great sites we're evaluating. Uh, we're targeting an in-service date, uh, first quarter 2016. Now, getting back to the, the theory, you can do these projects pretty quickly, a lot quicker than you can build a oil pipeline. Uh, crude supply will be dependent on the, the customer, uh, where he wants to source it. I can tell you the basis differential today, despite those high rail shipping rates, really supports oil sands out of Canada, which is why we chose, as part of our strategic review, to partner with Spectra Energy on our Inland California Express project. Why Spectra? Spectra had just purchased the Platte Express crew line. Uh, they had the Canadian producer contacts. They had a successful open season, and they really saw the opportunity to pipe that crew down to Capital Wyoming, load it on rail, bring it down to our system, and in this heavily congested rail corridor population center, use the last 100 miles of the trails to deliver the crew uh, into what we kind of call the LA Long Beach Refining Center, which really mm. originates at West Hines. So that's a West Hines tank farm. It virtually supplies uh, nine refineries with a total refining capacity of 1.2 million barrels a day. So we're about 10% of that. So that's our target market. What's interesting about these refiners is they're all set up to run on Alaska North Slope crew. So it's a heavier crew. And as Alaska North Slope crews decline, rather than set up to run LLS, which isn't as tractor to them, they really wanted to find the heavier crude, so they're being driven toward making a solution. A lot of them have sort of given up hope that Keystone XL and the northern section will get built. They need to move that crude now. So hopefully over the next uh, 
uh, several months, uh, we'll be successful getting uh, contract commitments for this particular project. Uh, we're excited by it. We've got a uh, we've got a lot of people, some, several in this room, uh, working on it and uh, doing a great job with the technical, which is in Clustar's responsibility, so the technical, the engineering design. Spectra has been leading the commercial side. Of the it's been a very good relationship. I'm not going to get into the, the highlights. We've kind of talked about it, but uh, generally it's taking advantage of the market differential we're seeing between heavy Canadian crude, the need for heavier crudes in California, that rent Canadian differential, which is probably close to the $30 a barrel when you look at it today. And that's where uh, refiners want to uh, take advantage of uh, attractive crude acquisition prices. So uh, stay tuned. This is an example of our track. You can see we're sandwiched between the rail line, I-10. This is all desert property. This is more of a teardrop, but it's a loop track. We'll be able to take two unit trains a day maximum. These are 120,000 barrels a day. We'll have storage. These are our above ground storage facilities. Uh, two trains will be able to uh, unload and uh, get off the main track. And uh, then our pipeline will run along the UP corridor. It's an existing utility corridor. Uh, we want to minimize, obviously, the uh, new pipeline. So that's a, a big cost to this overall project and one that, uh, depending upon the site selection, will have an impact on the rates we'll charge. So, a lot going on on the engineering side. So, uh, uh, you know, not only do we need petroleum engineers at Questar, you know, we need obviously uh, mechanical, civil, chemical. We, we, you know, a need for virtually all uh, disciplines. Our rail terminaling uh, engineering work is being done by Harris. Uh, essentially, each railroad requires you to use a certified engineering firm. They won't take just anyone. They need to know contract design for work, the radius of the track is proper, and I would say uh, it's going to be all about efficiency, efficiency, the timing from all of these trains, get them in and out. The more efficient you are, I think the more likely your terminal will be to uh, be used at uh, full capacity. Uh, we're working right away issues. Uh, we have, we own the line, we own the line right away issues, but over time we've seen encroachment. Uh, cities have expanded. There's some issues there that we're working on. And of course, the permitting, this won't be uh, permitted as a federal project for this part. It's going to fall out of the city process in California. A little different, and it's one that involves a lot more local input. Probably the lead agency would be one of the counties. So if we're in Riverside County, it would likely be uh, the county of Riverside to be the uh, sponsoring agency for us. So, Schedule-wise, uh, everything kind of hinges on our success getting uh, contracts. Basically, we like for one anchor uh, contract, it takes at least 50% of that capacity, and we're off and running. And as I said earlier, looking at a, a 2016 in-service day, this would be a real game changer for Questar Pipeline. It would get us back on the kind of historical growth pattern we were during the uh, Rockies uh, natural gas production zone. So it's uh, Important project for us. We've got a lot of resources on it, and uh, so far we've been very pleased with the reception we've gotten in the, in the marketplace. So just to give you an example of kind of how we're taking sort of the, the macro supply demand that's converting into business opportunities for our shareholders. Hopefully, uh, they can appreciate the uh, move for a bunch of gas boats to uh, jump into this, this crude business. But it's been a lot. Of, it's been very interesting. You may have enough questions. Anything's on the table? Yes? You know, that's, it's, it's more about uh, the liability around an event. So uh, our responsibility probably ends when the train leaves our facility, but it begins when it enters it. What's interesting, most of the Incidences that have occurred have been on the railroads themselves, whether you don't break the train properly. The tragedy that happened in uh, Quebec, you know, the guy only hit the engine brake, you know, and he left the engine running, which created enough breakage for the cars. But these engines were had a, a manual brake. He didn't set any of those. They had a fire on the engine. 
turn the engine off, they lost pressure to the brakes. It was on a pretty good slope. So the train got loose and uh, derailed at a turn in the middle of this city. So, you know, as a terminal operator or a pipeline operator, would we be liable for that? No. But it does impact, you know, the train operator. Their civil suits, their, uh, the, the company is bankrupt, by the way, that bankrupt them. So, you know, it's not a good thing when that happens to anyone in the industry. But I think the real risks are going to be on the part of the railroad. The most recent incident that occurred in, was at Castleton, North Dakota. They had a, a, a grain train derail, and they didn't realize that one of the cars, these were parallel tracks, they didn't realize that one of the grain cars had actually rolled over and was blocking the parallel track that the crew train was coming down. It was a unit train out of Baca. Obviously, it hit that uh, overturned car. It derailed itself. And it started it. And uh, that was a big event. And uh, that was a Burlington Northern uh, train incident. And, you know, they're dispatched. Their control centers are heavily mechanized. They do a great job. But you still have events like that. I don't think anyone would ensure that person. So, so I, I, uh, it'll be interesting to see what, you know, what the response is. Federally, I think it's going to mean uh, greater standards on the type of rail cars people use, like double wall, uh, containment systems, uh, uh, better uh, documentation on actually what was being transported. You know, there's some question that there are a lot of volatile gases associated with some of these crews, and uh, they're a lot more flammable than you know, a heavy crude might be. So there's a lot of investigation going on. But uh, you know, we'll see what happens. Uh, to me, it's, it's the big question will be environmental uh, concern because environmentalists realize the quickest way to stop growing oil sands production in Canada, which is a major greenhouse gas emitter, will be to shut down the infrastructure, right? I mean, that's the keystone debate. Now, whether canceling Keystone stops production, we can debate. I don't think it will. Whether they're attacking, I and mean, obviously, if people see that it's Canadian uh, crew coming in to you know their terminal, their community, you do want to see opposition. In fact, you're starting to see that up in Washington and San Francisco area. So it's, that's that's going to be interesting to follow. And, and the terminal operator who just unloads it. We're a pipeline operator too, and we don't really care where it comes from. We just want them to commit to the terminal. Pretty good batch anyway. I see the refiners; they have their own tank package. They can blend if they prefer to blend, or we can blend in our terminal and kind of create a synthetic AMS lookalike by blending uh, heavy crews with LOS. I mean, there's some processes underway that are pretty attractive work to do that. But yeah, safety is on everybody's mind in the pipeline industry today, and it's certainly on the railroad's uh, mind as their business starts to grow in this area. Yes? That's a, that's a good question. These, these are these 111 cars, or the earlier cars, uh, they're, uh, they've been going 15, 20 years. But yeah, they do need constant maintenance. It's like a pipeline. They need a They'll work on couplers. Uh, you'll see a bunch of derailed cars out by the airport being worked on. Those are uh, UP cars. But uh, yeah, if you maintain them, I think they're they're good. If you don't, uh, then you're going to have problems. And so even in a facility that unloads or loads it brings in, you know, 100 cars, the odds are you're going to have some cars that you don't want to pull out of there fully loaded. So you have to have room on your track to be able to take those cars off, bring the owner in or the uh, mechanics in to uh, uh, do the maintenance on them so you can get them back out. And so there are a lot of design requirements like that that the railroads require mm -hmm. as you think about building your terminal. So that's pretty interesting. That's a good question. Yeah. 